Good morning, Kids Live. Thank you for joining us this beautiful Sunday morning again. As you can see, birds are chirping, sun is out. If it's raining, I'm sorry. But before we get into it, before we get dancey and loose and warm and everything, I'm your Kuya Jules. This is your Kuya Sam. We're going to jump into the word first. I got two verses I want to share with y'all in the spirit of celebration it is our 32nd anniversary so this is the anniversary month um we'll jump into first corinthians 10 31 so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do do all to the glory of god and also uh ecclesiastes 3 13 also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil this is God's gift to man. So whatever you're doing, whatever has happened, celebrate because God deserves all the glory. And with that being said, let's get up, let's get turned, let's get warm, let's get it. All right, kids life, before we really jump into it, let's get warm. We don't want to pull no muscles or anything. And we're just going to start stretching. So let's go. Let's just love yourself. Love everybody. Don't touch no one, though. I mean, elbow bumps, fist bumps are socially acceptable now. So we're still in social distancing. All right, we're going to stretch your arm. So we'll grab the right. And we'll do a bit of a bounce on it. Good, Sam? You good. I want to go to the right side. <laughs> uh, your, your other right. This is the other right side. We'll just wind that out. Go back. So during the dance, we're going to get into some kind of like stretches and stuff as well. But this is just to get us warm. Shake everything out. Shake everything out. And we'll get the leg, we'll just kick. Don't kick no one. You need to hold something, hold something. Just get the legs loose. And we'll switch to the other side. Get to the left. Ah. Ah. You touch your toes, 10 points. Ah. 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 All right. And we'll just grab the left. Apparently you can hold your balance if you hold your ear, but I think it's a lie. You kids tried it, huh? And we'll try the other one. And you hold on to something, hold on to something. Alright, let's just get loose. And we'll jump into it. Alright, let's do it. Fist bumps, elbows, social distance. Let's get it. Ugh. Let's get loose, feel it. Kids, make sure you don't hit your brothers and sisters. But we'll get into it. Really simple. We're gonna fist in the air. We're gonna go left, then right. Ready? And left, right. Left, left, then right. Left, right, right, then heel. Ah, ah, yeah. Get it, get it, get it. And clap. Yeah, in the morning, it from the other side. Yeah, I've been a back, I could have swore I died. Left, yeah, right, dodging the left, looking for a right, facing my left, hoping for a right, telling my left, they can get the stuff. And I was lost, no, I was hiding. Out and in, chasing out the wind and put it out again. In, trying to get out of bags, in, trying to get out and in, should have been out and back, in, didn't know what I and clap. Celebrate, celebrate, right, levitate, there'll be better days. Then left, right, left, right, then left, left, and get into it again. Hey, yeah, hey. Yep, get it, and kick, right, left, right, left, right, left, and again, and we gotta celebrate, cause like the year's over, right, we gonna do it good, 
And low. Right. Right. And low. All I Love. want is the cake for my birthday. Ah. Yeah. Closing our houses and open the businesses. We went to college and finish it. And we'll skip. Yeah, if we take it out, then we elevate. Don't let your food get cold. Looking at somebody else. And clap. Right. 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 Prove it. Right. Come on, baby. Let's wake up and celebrate. And we'll stretch. Slowly to the right. Don't pull anything. When you get what you want, you still want more. In the end, you know that life story won't. So baby, worry less. And we'll celebrate some more. Ready? And celebrate more. Hey. Ah. Left. Woo! And right. Left. Ah, uh, and scoop. Hey. 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 Yeah. 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 Again. And. Bah. Woo. Ah. Okay. Yeah. Hey. Ah. Ah. Welcome to another week of Kids Life. In today's lesson, we're going to learn about obedience. Atalina, what's obedience? So, obedience is when someone is willing to do something that someone else has told them to do who's in authority. Just like how our parents ask us to stop playing that game and you listen and you stop, that's it. That's obedience. Wow, that's, that's good. Yeah. And so today we're going to follow the story of Adam and Eve and how they disobeyed God who was in authority. And if you do want to follow along, open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2 to 3. And it talks about how God gave Adam and Eve a wonderful garden. And now this wasn't just any garden, but it was a garden full of beautiful trees and flowers and it had rivers and really cool insects and animals. And God let Adam and Eve do anything they wanted to do in the garden, except he had one rule. Do you know what that rule was? Um, no hat, no play. <laughs> Close, but no. The rule was that they could eat from any tree they wanted to, except from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But little did they know, there was Satan in the form of a snake. And he wanted Adam and Eve to disobey God. And one day, Satan finally convinced Adam and Eve to eat the fruit from the tree that God said not to eat from. And instead of listening to what God said, they listened to what Satan said. Oh, no! So Adam and Eve felt really bad after they disobeyed God. And God had no other choice but to send them out of the garden. And just like how he disciplined Adam and Eve, God wants to teach us the importance of being obedient. So in our Bible story today, God tells Adam and Eve to not eat the fruit from a specific tree. And do you, who remembers? Did they listen? No, they didn't. They didn't end up following God's instructions. But in our Bible activity today, it's going to be something really cool. And we're going to be testing your Atta Danielle's obedience. So for this portion of the activity, we're going to be doing this maze. Now, this is going to be a bit tricky because you're going to need a blindfold and you're going to need a pen. Ata Alina is going to test my obedience and I have to try and make it to the end without looking. So if you want to join us, go on our Facebook page. We have posted the maze and you can be tested by your siblings or your parents whether you're listening and you're obeying. Okay. I'm going to trust you with this. Yep, so blindfold on. All right, okay. I'm blindfolded. I can't see anything. Yep, okay, I'll do this for you. Okay. Okay, hold it. Yeah. Now, I'm going to place it at the start. Okay. Okay. Now, you got to oh listen, gosh. okay? okay. Yeah. All right, so go up, up, up. Yep, keep going until I say stop, stop. And now to your right, slowly, yep. Keep going, keep going, stop. And then you wanna go up, all the way up. Yep, 
Nearly there. Stop. And now that this one's pretty long, you want to go to your right and just draw a straight line all the way. Yep, keep going. <laughs> keep going. Keep going. A bit more. Yep, and then stop. And then you can go up. Yeah, nice. All the way up. <laughs> You're going diagonal, but all the way up. <laughs> Oh gosh. All the way up. Yeah, nearly there. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> All right, stop. And now to your left. Yep, straight line to your left. Keep going. Keep going. And then stop. And then down. This one's a short one. Down. Yep, down. Keep going. And then stop. And then this is a long one. Now all the way to your left. Just keep drawing a straight line. I don't think this is straight. No, it's, yeah, <laughs> kind of. Keep going. OK. Yep, keep going. Until I say stop, you're nearly there. Yep, you just want to keep going straight. Nearly there. Yep, now stop, now up, all the way up. You're nearly to the end. You got this. Nearly there, all the way up. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. Stop. Good job. <laughs> okay, guys. So this is the result of my maze. Now, the lesson of this is if I'm listening to Atalina's voice and if I'm trusting her, then I can make it to the end. And we should be like that with God too. We should be listening and we should be trusting his voice and he'll bring us to the place that we need to be. Yeah. So I hope you had fun doing this activity and share us your results. Bye Kids Live. Bye. Before I begin, happy anniversary to all of you. You're here and also you at home watching wherever you may be. Happy anniversary and good morning to you. Magandang umaga sa inyo lahat. I'd like to welcome you to FCF Life Center, the Church on the Highway, as we continue on in this month of our celebration, our commemoration of God's faithfulness to us all through the years. 32 already. I'd like to read from Psalm 33, 1 to 9. For our devotion, more well not devotion really, of our celebration and our exaltation of God's faithfulness and goodness to us. Psalm 33. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make melody to him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and he stood fast. And so we thank you, Lord God, for you are sitting on a throne. No matter what's happening, Lord God, you are in control. 
and you have overshadows our lives. You put a canopy upon us in protection, provision, in healing. And we thank you. We may be able to stand before you and celebrate your presence in our lives. And we may give glory unto you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Why don't we continue to stand and let's sing worship unto our God this morning. Come on.
praise, Lord Jesus, for you deserve it, Lord God, for there is no other name higher than yours, Lord Thank God. You. No other name higher than yours, Lord Jesus. So, Father God, we come this morning, Lord, with our hearts surrendered, our lives open before you just as we are, Lord God. We come, Lord Jesus, as a living sacrifice. Before you, Lord Jesus, holy, pleasing, we declare of your goodness and your faithfulness over us this morning, Lord God. We praise you, Lord Jesus. We praise you. Amazing love, thou welcomes me. The kindness of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving. God, your son. for me 
both now and forever. Thank you, Jesus. God, you're so sing of his faithfulness this morning. God, you're so good. For the last 32 years, come on. God, you're so good. You are, Lord, you are. God, you're so good. You're so
blessed hope. You are an anchor to our souls, God. Whether we're standing here or we're at home or anywhere we may be, join together in celebration of your presence in our lives. We commend ourselves, O oh Lord, wherever, however, that those who are here and the shepherds, leaders, workers, servers, we all love you, Lord. Love you dearly and dedicated to you. And truly, we thank you for your overshadowing us with your love, with your graces, your compassion and loving kindness that we may all be of help in you, Lord God. And we thank you, Father God, for whatever circumstance we may be facing, whether it's sickness, O oh Lord, want, whatever thing that we may set in us, we thank you, Lord, that you break the walls, the walls before us. And you carry us, Lord, over the fire. You carry us over the waters, Lord. And we thank you for everyone, Lord, of your family. People that call, that call upon you, Lord, in love and in commitment. We bless you and thank you. How you uphold us, spirit, soul, and body, in every way, O oh Lord God, through protection, through provision, through whatever circumstance, Lord. And we thank you, Father God, for the goodness of your heart toward us. And we praise you and thank you and honor you, Lord God, in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we all here, here, we say, Amen. Amen. We may be seated. Good morning, SCF. Welcome to another church news. It's lovely to see you all this Sunday morning, whether you're worshiping at the sanctuary or you're worshiping at home, like myself, we welcome you, and here are your announcements. As we continue to follow the COVID restrictions, our Wednesday midweek prayer rally will continue online on Zoom. You can find the link on our Facebook and Instagram page. So we would love for you to join us as we pray for our family, our friends, and the world. For those who are giving tithes and offering, we are receiving them through our online account. And here are the details down below. And for those who are with us in the sanctuary, please wait until after the service to drop off your tithes and offering. Well, that is it for another church news. But before we go, make sure you tell us online or even the person next to you, what is your favorite worship song? Well, that is it. Have a great one. Love God, love people, and take care. So my favourite memory at SCF would have to be from our 30th anniversary Sports Fest Day. What makes it my favourite is the atmosphere of the day. I remember not only seeing YD participate, but everyone from SCF participating, which made it really fun to play with and against them. It's kind of hard to pick my favourite memory since our church has had so many events, but my top two would have to be the Easter egg hunts where the parents are just a bit more competitive than the kids themselves, and carols at the car park where I get to see the titas and titos perform. There have been so many events at church, but my favourite moment is when we have carols at the car park. It's so nice to see everyone singing and holding their candles in the air, plus our performances are cool. My favourite memories at FCF are the Christmas carols that we have every year. I love when you get to see everyone's dancing or their performances and when they're all preparing for the food and the performances and I love that our whole church family is there. Um, I also really like how whether you know the lyrics or not, everyone sings um, some encouragement. Um, when you're having trouble, you didn't have to fight alone. I mean, you have an entire church and God right beside you. So don't be afraid to ask someone for help. So my encouragement for someone at SCM would be to put your trust in God. Our God is someone who provides for us in any situation. So put your trust in Him and He will provide. 
As an encouragement, I would say don't be afraid to be vulnerable with one another because in the end it helps us to not only nurture ourselves but our walk with God and each other. My encouragement to FCF would be to remember that God is still very gracious, um, especially in these difficult times. Um, from personal experience, there's been a lot of change, a lot of uh, struggle and a lot of new challenges that I haven't really experienced before, but despite all of that, um, God's grace is still very evident. His love and His um, faithfulness really don't change, um, and you can always count on that, whether things are new or things keep cycling for you. Um, and know that God's got your back and your church family does too. I can call FCF home because when I first moved to Australia, um, it's one of the first places that I got familiar with um, that I grew up in and I got to grow up around people and a church family who cared about me, who helped me grow with my faith um, and who strengthened me along 14 years of my life. So I call FCF my family because I pretty much grew up here. I've been attending FCF since I could remember and I love it. I consider it a second home to be honest. I love the people and just getting to know everyone on a Sunday and a Friday. I love the atmosphere and just being in the presence of God with everyone at SCF. I love our strong sense of community because we are always helping each other out and making each other feel belong. This is why I call SCF my home. I was born and raised in SCF, so from the very beginning it's already been home to me. I've been embraced by a lot of people here and I've been led by so many that have helped me to be vulnerable and have led me in the right country direction. So overall, SCF will continue to have a massive impact on my life. So thank you so much to Pastor Rudy and Pastor Marion and SCF, happy 32nd anniversary! Happy 32nd anniversary! Happy 32nd anniversary! Happy 32nd anniversary, church! today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to give our tithes and our offerings because we know, dear God, that we come with sincere heart and appreciation for everything that you have done, for you have been a faithful God to us through these years. Father, you know the situation of every family in here, the places that they come from and where they're coming from even as we experience these challenging times of the pandemic. But we know that you are strong, you are mighty, you are greater and even more than enough than the situation you are facing. We know, oh Father, that you are able to provide all our needs according to riches and glory by Christ Jesus our Lord. And today, dear Lord, we come against any stronghold of poverty, of want, of unemployment, of bankruptcies, of anxiety and fear, and we release the spirit of prosperity, the spirit of greatness, of goodness, of your mercy, of your love, of salvation, of healing, of your strength upon this nation, even your churches, and even the situation we are here in these families. We thank you, dear God, that you'll provide for us the things that we need because you are a God of provision. You are the miracle working God. You are the God, the maker of all things. You are a faithful God, a tower of strength in any situation that we come in through. Father, we come with you, O oh Lord, with thankfulness, with our hearts, and with this seed. We are giving our tithes and offerings to you for those people who are here today into this offering box, and those in the coming days who will be transferring and even banking through their banking system, that this is a seed of faith, that we will know, God, that this seed will grow, the seed will multiply, not just tenfolds, fiftyfolds, or more than a hundredfold, that you will bless your people, salvation, healing, strength, goodness, mercy, and love for everyone, for your people, for your church, for your situation, for the community where we live, and even in Australia, and even outside of this place. Because we know, dear God, that you are a God who will meet our needs, not just for today, but for in the future. We know that we are victorious in Christ Jesus, our Lord, because you have won the victory for us. Because we know, God, that you will make it 
possible for each and every one of us that we are victors, not victims. Lord, we are ahead, not behind. We are above, not beneath. And because of that, we are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And with this, we give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. We give you worship. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. It is, for those of you who are in the sanctuary today, it is nice to see your faces. Some of you I haven't seen during this whole pandemic, uh, so it is nice to see your faces. Uh, for those of you mostly uh, who are watching from home, uh, hello as well and good morning. So, the scene, that the slide that I'm gonna show you uh, just now is an iconic Australian scene. So we'll just uh, move to the first slide. So for those of you who are at home, feel free to raise your hand as well, but I am gonna ask the people here, raise your hand if you have seen this personally, if you've been here. Yep, okay. Many of us have. So this is the 12 apostles in Victoria, right? I know that when my family went there some years ago, that there were only eight that could be seen out of the 12. So the 12 apostles were formed by erosion. So the harsh and the extreme weather conditions from the Southern Ocean were very, very gradually eroded the soft limestone to form um, these caves in the cliffs. And the caves became arches, that eventually the arches collapsed and they left some of these rock stacks which are, which are, some of them are about 50 meters high. And over time, the 12 rock stacks have become eight as the water has caused four of them to fall and disappear. Also this month, we celebrate our 32nd anniversary as a church. And it was a scene like this or even this next scene of the Roman Forum in Italy, which I formed this message around. So anyone been to the Roman Forum? Okay, great. If you've not, this is, um, this is a pretty good photo. It's not mine, and I'll, I'll tell you why it's not mine, because when I went here with a group of uh, four other girls, the digital camera was just coming out. No joke. Um, <laughs> and I remember the only person out of the five of us who had a digital camera was Medi Mendiola Planner. <laughs> and not only did she have a digital camera, but she brought her analog camera as well. So um, this is just an aside, I was just thinking about this, because at that time, for the young ones especially, the digital cameras could only probably hold maybe like 50 or 100, maybe a bit more, okay, if someone's, maybe less? Less, less photos. So once you took like 30 photos with a digital camera, you had to go home and then upload them onto these disks. And you don't want to lose those disks because <laughs> then you lose all your photos. So she carried this new digital camera around and also her analog. So every photo we took, can you imagine with five girls uh, <laughs> in their mid-20s um, taking <laughs> <laughs> and then taking with the analog, all the analog cameras because we couldn't share photos either. And then this new digital camera as well. But this is the Roman Forum in Italy. Um, and I, I actually thought that it was a fitting scene to kind of um, springboard this message around. You know, it's, God, it's what God wants to speak to each and every one of us today, especially for those of you who are in ministry. Um, and we know we're all ministers of Jesus, right? So today I wanted to bring a message about what God requires us to sustain and remain a dynamic, meaningful church that represents the work of God in this area of Western and Southwestern Sydney. And when I stood um, as a 20-something-year-old, actually it wasn't mid-20s, less than that, 20-something-year-old um, in front of the remnants of the Roman Forum and the surrounding sites, something really stood out. Because you see these boulders, you see these enormous stones fallen, 
ruined building blocks, which were, you know, part of a magnificent structure. And you realize that it wasn't like this at the beginning. It wasn't like this at the beginning. See, the Roman Forum didn't look like it does now as it did in the beginning. I mean, there was a time, a really great time, when the Roman Forum was the center and the hustle and bustle of daily life in in ancient Rome. It was where important people met and they carried out important responsibilities and now that's over. You know, it's just a tourist site. What lies there are reminders of the passing of time and the realities of erosion. And there's a need for us as a body of people who are involved, who are plugged in, who are participating in a ministry here by the grace of God on its 32nd year to be warned. You see, decisions are made along the way that make a difference. And if vigilance isn't accompanied by commitment from us, erosion will take its toll. Now, I'm not alarmed, but I have a, um, a real uh, knowing uneasiness as our world, our culture, our society moves in the wrong direction. Our culture is farther from what we once knew. It's farther removed from what we once knew. It really is. You just have to see that with what's happening in the States and on some level even happening here, it is harder now to stand as for Christ than it was 20 or 30 years ago when this church began. It is harder now to stand for Christ than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Who knows what will happen in the next 10 or 20 years? So what are the essentials to a dynamic, long-lasting ministry in life? The Bible explains several essential ingredients that can give our lives and ministries significance that outlives us and ensures that we stay stay the course and our passion and our love for God remains the same. So we're going to look towards, uh, today we're going to really look towards the end of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, and then the next chapter, 16, verses 13 and 14. So we're going to go there now. So 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Then the next chapter, 16. Be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, And the original text in Greek says, act like men or grow up, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. No ministry is uh, promised perpetual or continual success. And as much as we would love that to be true, there is no guarantee that what we are today at our very core, that our love for God at our very core, that we will be like that. 10 years from now or 20 years from now or even beyond that. There's no guarantee that we will be the same tomorrow at our core as we are today or where we've been, you know, when we started in 1988. And there's heaps of evidence in history and in the scriptures that highlight the fact that there is no guarantee that greatness can be sustained or can be continued unless, of course, we take the steps that are taken to make that happen. And in doing this, I'm thinking about the Church of Ephesians. Most of you would have heard or would know of the letter to the Ephesians in the book of Revelations in chapter 2. But many of you may not be acquainted with the history of the church that was founded in the ancient city of Ephesus. So now Paul was a part of that. Aquila and Priscilla, who Paul had trained, you know, they were left to build the church once Paul left. Um, And along with Paul, there was Timothy there, who takes up the torch and ministers in Ephesus as well. So now the beginning of the church is around 53 to 54 
AD. And I've got a very simple timeline. So don't you Bible scholars say that timeline's not correct. It is a very, very simple timeline just for the purposes of this message. But now at the beginning of the church is around 53 to 54 AD. And it was a great beginning. You know, how many churches can boast that they had three years of the Apostle Paul, along with Aquila, Priscilla, Apollos. You know, it was a really historic beginning. And over time, the church of Ephesus made a difference in the land of Turkey, which was called Asia Minor at the time, but it's Turkey, modern-day Turkey. You know, then um, there in this coastal city, the church attracted many people, especially those who were traveling and Ephesus became really wealthy and prosperous. So the church itself even attracted the Apostle John as one of their pastors along the way towards the end. But on his journey back to Jerusalem, Paul came through the area again of Asia Minor, of the modern-day Turkey, and he invited the elders of the church to meet in the little coastal town, an island of Amaltus. He knew that it was probably the last time that he would, see, he would visit them and see them in person. So it was important for Paul to speak to the church leaders of um, Ephesus. And while he was with the elders, he warned them. He said, you need to watch out because among you, wolves will enter in. And in their savage attacks, they will take on the sheep of the church and over time, their presence will take a toll. He said, watch out. And that's in Acts 20, verses 30 to 31, if you want to read that later. But the message, the message which was, about a, which was a warning to the church of Ephesus would have stung a little bit, I think. Because when Paul delivered this message in about 57 AD, the church was strong. You know, it was growing, it was being watered, and, and, and it was in its prime. So I wonder if some of the leaders thought, you know what, this Paul, man, we love him, <laughs> helped found the church, but he's a little over the top here, a little over the top. But you see, Paul knew, Paul knew what could happen in a church when there isn't vigilance, when there isn't an alertness. So he left them with that warning. And they wept with him, and they prayed with him, and he was gone, never to see them again in person. And what was a great church, it moved on, and over time, it eroded. I need you to listen. When you, tra when you trace the history of this great church of Ephesus, you realize that that warning that Paul was, that had given the church leaders, like I said, was AD 57. When the book of Revelations was written, it was about AD 90. So that's the second chapter. The very first church that is mentioned was the church of emphasis. And John, who wrote the book of Revelations, he writes to tell them that the Lord has something against them. He says, and you all know, they have left their first love. They have left their first love. They didn't love the Lord like they once did, or once used to. And John, he writes to the church, urging them to repent. Already in just less than 40 brief years, in less than 40 brief years, perhaps, Less than that, probably about 33 years, the church had begun to erode. They had drifted. It didn't have the same passion, drive, momentum, dynamic that it used to. And over time, like all the other churches, all the other seven churches except for one, it began to lose its impact on the community. Buildings that had once stood tall and strong no longer stood. And over the passing of time, buildings that had once been, you know, the major part in the world in the first century was but rubble. 
rubble, huge boulders. Tell you, no ministry is guaranteed continual success. It's not automatic. It's not given. What we as a church have enjoyed and enjoy and have enjoyed over the last 32 years is not something that is guaranteed us over the next 32 or even the next five or the next two. And this is the same for our lives and the legacy that we leave or do not leave. Whether our lives stay on course or don't stay on course, we're not guaranteed that our lives are going to stay on course. And at this point, I want to say that there are many you know, significant things that have been going on in the last six months of this ministry, many which maybe the public is not aware of. And even though we're mostly online, ministry is and has been going on in the past six months. You know, in many ways, that you may not be aware. But several times outside our regular Hope ministry, we've provided groceries and homeware to families who couldn't be catered for at this time because the other charities in this area were burdened by other needs. We provi- we've provided food and clothing to international students who've lost their jobs because of COVID-19. We've supported a couple of churches in the Philippines by providing them finances for essential goods for their congregations. Where people have been sick or lonely, our pastors have some visited and prayed sometimes. Life group leaders, our YD team have been creative with connecting with members using technology. Our prayer meetings have seen a healthy attendance with people who have never exhorted in public before doing so in the first time on Zoom. We've miraculously been receiving healthy tithes and offering amounts, you know, experiencing only a very minimal drop, unlike the national average suggests. We've received donations of masks and food without asking. Our multimedia, our helps, our worship, our leadership teams have worked hard behind the scenes. Some of them, they come here straight after night shift to ensure that we can stream quality services to everyone while also having some of you safely, very, very safely join us each week. We've taken each government regulation and suggestion to heart, and we've done it like with excellence. I I don't think there are many churches who have taken the regulations to heart as much as we have at this church. And even during this lockdown, we've gained in membership numbers. A couple of you here today. We've seen people give their lives to Jesus through online services. I mean, that deserves a praise the Lord, right? Praise the Lord. Amen. And even yet, on our 32nd anniversary, it is important, and with all that, it's still important that we take heed to pay attention. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Like, let him who, who, ta- who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And this is true for us as individuals, but also us as a church, as a collective. Let any church that is currently engaged in a dynamic, meaningful, momentous ministry take note unless it drifts and ultimately falls. So I ask the question again, what is essential in order for us to sustain a strategic ministry over the course of time without drifting away or falling to erosion? What must we do? What must we be? You know, what are the essential ingredients that keep a church, a ministry going strong today? you know, in decades to come. We'll go back to 1 Corinthians shortly, but it's interesting that in a brief period of about 40 years, erosion had taken its toll on what was once the great church of Ephesus. And by 200 AD, as you saw on that timeline, that church was no more. Because the three things to note about erosion. Erosion is silent. Erosion is slow, and erosion 
is subtle. So erosion is silent, it's slow, it's subtle. And as time passes by, there's a letting down of the guard, there's a slow drift that kicks in, and that once passionate pursuit that we used to have becomes a robotic responsibility. Just going through the motions, you know, and ultimately, change in your heart and your mindset sets in. And the church and its passion and its love for God and people didn't, doesn't look like it did at its beginning. It's our um, anniversary month, so I'll talk about our lead pastors who are my parents. I don't do this. I rarely do this. Um, but I, I felt like I, I should today. But there aren't very many words to describe how my parents care about the ministry of FCF. Even though it hasn't been smooth sailing, even though it's caused a lot of heartbreak, heartache, they love this ministry. They're committed to it. They love those who are part of it. And they care about who we are, what we do, and why we do it. They care about where we're going, what will happen in the years to come until our Lord's return, They may not be the most outwardly expressive, but I know every night for the last three decades, they pray faithfully for every one, every single night. I've heard it as a teenager and a young adult living in their home in Bosley Park, and as they've moved in with me, just me, Jack, and Glenn, uh, this year, I still hear it every single day without fail. They're committed now as they were as young parents. And I know that there are many of you, there are many of you here and listening to us online who are also as committed week in and week out to this dynamic ministry we've been called to serve, to participate, to grow in. So what will we be like, FCF? What will characterize FCF in 2030, 2050? Will we have left our first love? Will our love for Jesus cooled? Will there be that sense of commitment and passion about things that matter, things that are eternal? Will God's word still be significant to us so that it still gives us guidance and speaks to the relevance of our lives The decisions we make, the way we live, the way we raise our families, the way we spend our time and our money and our effort. What is essential for us to sustain a dynamic ministry that will stay the course of time, over time, and through the storms in life? Now, there are probably 20 or 30 things that we could talk about and we could list. But because of time, we'll limit to limit it to a few. So I'm going to bring you back to this summary verse in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It says, therefore, therefore, now this is a wrap up of a very lengthy letter that uh, Paul had written to the church of Corinth about a number of things that they were concerned about that became his concern also. And although he wasn't there with them, he writes this letter because he knows the situation, and he brings these words. When you read these words, they ring true today, in today's context, even though they were written thousands of years ago. They still ring true today. It's almost like he wrote it last night. But he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toll is not in vain in the Lord. So the four essentials that I want to highlight in verse 58, and then we are going to drop to verse 13 in chapter 16, says, therefore, so therefore, men and women of FCF Church in August 2020, my beloved sisters and brothers, be steadfast. And if you're writing or if you're noting this down, mark it, circle it, write it steadfast, because I'll come back to it later. And then we're going to drop to verse 13 in chapter 16. But the first phrase, be steadfast, it answers to be on alert. So be on alert answers to be steadfast. They, they are linked. 
Second, the word we go back to um, when we uh, go to 58 again, so the next slide. But the second word is immovable. Immovable. And it answers to the second phrase in verse 13, stand firm in the faith. When a church is immovable, then we are those who stand firm in the faith. The third slide, the next slide, the third word is abounding. So steadfast, immovable, abounding. And we look at verse 13, chapter 16, it says, act like men. Probably can't say that these days, <laughs> you know, in, in PC world, but act like men. When we paraphrase, it's grow up, grow up. Have maturity, let maturity mark your life. That's what it's saying. No longer is it time to be a teenager, a child. It's time to act like a man and woman. Um, and that ties in with abounding. And we'll talk about it more later. And fourth is knowing that your toil is not in vain. It's not in vain. And I'd like to use the word confident here. So you're confident that nothing you do for him is a waste of time and effort. That's what the me Message Bible says. That you're confident that nothing you do for him is a waste of time and effort. So, and being confident in will make you strong. So see the verse in, uh, the word in verse 13. So be strong, they tie together. So I'm gonna tie that all together, the summary. But part of being steadfast is being on alert. By remaining immovable, we stand firm in the faith. And as we abound in the Lord's work, we're growing towards maturity. We're acting like adults, being confident that our toil is never in vain because when we are confident in that, we become strong in our everyday walk, knowing that what we're doing is not a waste of time and effort. This was written to the church in Corinth, but it's written to us today as well. I want you to take this personally. I, want you to take this personally, church. These are words that will make a difference if they're lived out in our lives. These are words that will make a difference to our future as a church. If they're ignored, we'll be like so many others that within a matter of time, just a forgotten memory of what was once, what, 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 what once was, which is something that no, no, none of us here, none of us want. So I call these essential elements of a dynamic ministry. These are the ingredients to keeping a church, to keeping our personal ministry, our own walk with God on course and guard against that silent, slow, subtle drift into dangerous waters. So let's look at the first one. Steadfast, and it answers to the words, be alert, in verse 13. Now, steadfast is a pretty boring word, I'm going to say. It's nothing spectacular. Um, it, it's not really that interesting, not excitement. There's no entertainment with it. It just, it really means being settled, solid, reliable, steady, firm, firmly committed, to eternal things, which would include being committed to the truth of God, the word of God, and the name of Jesus Christ. And for all of those that to take place, verse 13 says that we must stay alert. We must be ever watchful. Both you and I, we must be watchful. All who teach in this ministry all who are growing their families in this ministry, all who are engaged in the life of this ministry, we must be, we must be reliable, steady, rooted, firmly committed to eternal faith, forever on alert. You know, we're not forgetting that a lack of vigilance is the st first step to going adrift. Paying attention 
listening to what is said and what is not said, watching over this dynamic ministry, staying alert and awake. You know, that's all part of being steadfast. And I urge you, I urge you today, just as Paul urged the Ephesians in 57 AD, I urge you, every one of you who is increasing in their growth of Christ, that as you do, you become more and more steadfast, less interested in the fads, less taken by the world and the things that are around you. Because although we live in the world, we don't take our cues from it and we certainly aren't verified or confirmed by it. Like I said, erosion, slow, subtle, silence, It never just happens quickly. You know, just those who fail in their work, walk with Christ, it doesn't just happen like that. You know, no one suddenly loses their love for Jesus. No one just suddenly backslides. Just as no tree suddenly, without any reason, falls. You know why a tree suddenly falls? Well, it's not suddenly, but it rots from within. And ultimately, no matter the size of a tree, if that rot grows, it finally gives way and it collapses. No church suddenly splits. No marriage suddenly breaks up. In order for us to sustain ministry, so that we had the same passionate heart as once we, once we started, and if, if not more, there must be a quality of steadfastness. Like I said, erosion takes place, never quickly, never loud, never obvious, slow, silent, subtle, but erosion will take its toll. I've said this for a long time before, but you shift one degree if you shift one degree from where you're meant to be and you keep on going over time, what happens? One degree over time, the distance between where you're meant to be and where you are gets greater over time, even though it was one degree at the start. And we need to be alert and aware how persuasive the lure of the world system is And the God of me, 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 me can draw you away from what is eternal. Erosion, remember, is silent and slow. I'm sure that none of you get up in the morning and say, you know, how can I drift today? How can I backslide today? How can I, you know, love God less? How can I serve him less today? I mean, none of you are waking up doing that. That doesn't happen. You drift because you've kicked it into neutral. There's no vigilance. There's no attention. There's no awareness. And you get a bit sluggish and sleepy regarding the things of God because your focus is on Elsa. Your focus is on you. Your focus is on other things. and not the things of God which you might have once been so passionate about. Second, immovable. And this answers to being firm and standing firm in the faith. This is the only time in the New Testament that this original word appears. It's a unique word in Greek that was, that was used, translated immovable. When unique words are used, it calls for special attention. You know, if there was a word better than this, the Holy Spirit would have let Paul use it. But Paul used this word because it was the best word. One commentary I read says, that, uh, says about the word immovable. It says, the Corinthians must not allow themselves to be loosed from their moorings. So a mooring is where a ship is tied or docked. So it's this idea of being very tightly secured or anchored, you know, tireless, relentlessly uh, diligent in the things of the faith. As a church, uh, one thing that we're good at, we're relentlessly diligent about the teaching of the word, 
you know, and it calls that we're not given to the ways, the times um, of, that we live in at this point in time. You know, we're not taken ba- by, you know, religious and cultural fads and shifts. I'm not here to tickle your ears with catchphrases and motivational quotes that you could have picked up from any self-help book. I go to the Bible. You draw from the Bible. What is it teaching? And the problem with us today is that we don't know the difference between Bible and what we picked up from a motivational book. That's the slow, silent, subtle erosion. But the Bible calls us to be relentlessly diligent, immovable. Another example of being immovable is being calm in crisis and trial. You know, if I knew that COVID-19 was coming up, you know, we would have warned each other about it. But I don't know. No one knew. God knew, but I mean, none of us humans knew. You know, I don't know what's going to happen in the world. But I know that our culture is moving in the wrong direction and it's been doing it for a long time. And I know that Christians are a target of that. And if you don't know that, then you're not awake. Because there are some places where making yourself known as a Christian is pretty much giving up your right to work at that place any longer. It's very difficult to be a sold out and out Christian and believer and make it known even tactfully, even graciously, without it taking sometimes a personal toll in this very, very politically correct world. Nevertheless, we are to be immovable. We are to stand firm in the things of faith. We stand firm in the word of God. I mean, I know when my, in my parents' time, when they were kids, right and wrong were very clear. It was very clear. There was a clear line between what was right and what was wrong. Now, today, it is absolutely blurred. You can barely call out something for being right or wrong in the midst of non-believers these days. You know, Oprah said, oh, it's your truth. I mean, that's rubbish. I'm sorry. It's either truth or not truth. There isn't your truth and someone else's truth. It's truth or not. I mean, you look at the news, and on both sides, the news have been called out for fake news. You don't know what to believe. But to be calm in the midst of crisis doesn't mean that you don't care. It doesn't mean we don't panic even when things, tough things occur. At around uh, 5.30 in the evening on December 10, 1914, a massive explosion erupted in New Jersey. Ten buildings, including five, which housed the, all of the work of Thomas Edison, the famous inventor, were engulfed in flames. Between six and eight fire departments rushed to the scene, but the chemical-fueled inferno was too powerful to put out quickly. So a man went rushing to find Thomas Edison, in his house, saying a fryer had broke out and that it couldn't be contained. And witnesses said that Edison, he calmly walked over, he was looking for his son, Charles, and he said to his son, go get your mother and all her friends. They'll never see a fire like this before, again. And when his son objected, Edison said, it's all right, we're just getting rid of a lot of rubbish. Later at the scene of the blaze, Edison was quoted in the New York Times saying, I'll start all over again tomorrow. He was only 67 years young. He stuck to his word and immediately began rebuilding the next morning without firing any of his employees. It was estimated that he lost about 920,000 US dollars, which is about 32 million Australian dollars in in today's world. The flames had consumed years of priceless records, prototypes, his plants, insurance, only covered about a third of the damage. But after three weeks, with a sizable loan from his friend Henry Ford, Edison got part of his plant up and running. And his employees, they worked hard and they produced more than ever before. And his team the next year went on to make 10 million US dollars in revenue, and which equals about 280 million Australian dollars today. So not only did he suffer this spectacular disaster, he replied and recovered in a spectacular way. How will you and I 
recover or respond in crisis? How are we re responding in today's crisis? See, when we move through life, there must be a trait of perseverance. And many of you here are wonderful examples of perseverance. You've endured great times of suffering, sicknesses that have invaded your body, the tragic loss of loved ones, the loss of a job or a dream or whatever the major test of your life is, you've remained immovable. And I have no ideas what trials we may face, what surprises are on the horizon, what, culture, what challenges our culture will throw at us. But all the more important that we stand firm in doctrinal and biblical fidelity, financial accountability, ethical integrity, and moral purity. We're strong in the word and unwavering in our convictions. If we are not, we'll be like the church of Ephesus. So third, always abounding, enthusiastic. Emerson said, the poet Emerson said, nothing great has ever been accomplished without enthusiasm. Excitement, excelling in all the things that we do, and don't miss that adverb, always, always abounding, always enthusiastic, always. It's going that extra mile, keeping a positive attitude, saying yes to opportunity. It's being in our service, friendly with each other, our willingness to adapt and welcome the Holy Spirit in evangelism, in our music, in our work with new members. You know, it's, it's having joy and laughter. You know, do you know Christians who are always frowning? I mean, seriously, wow. I mean, why? <coughs> you know, they're boo, thumbs down to everything. Whatever we do, do it eagerly to help others. You know, when you go to a real five-star hotel, you know how it's a, you know it's a real five-star hotel by their staff. When their service staff are, my pleasure, everything's my pleasure. You ask for something, it's my pleasure. You know, you know it's a real five-star hotel. When you go to a hotel and it's like, oh, yes, yeah, um, we'll, we'll, I'll send somebody up in, you know, in five, ten minutes when we're done with something else. You know, they don't have time for you. But in a real five-star hotel, the service staff are always abounding. Everything's their pleasure. They're enthusiastic about everything. And that needs to be part of our DNA. As Pastor Yun often says, we get to serve others. You know, that's our privilege. How different the experience of this comedian, uh, Robert Henry. The example is from Nine Keys of Successful Leadership but he um, visited a large department store in search for a pair of binoculars, and as he walked up to the counter, he noticed that he was the only customer in the store, and behind the counter were two salespeople. One of them was really preoccupied on their phone, talking to mama, um, and the other one just refused to acknowledge Robert. So he stood there, he was growing impatient, and he walked to the end of the counter, and finally one of them looked up at her, him and said, you got a number? He said, I got a what? Asked Robert, you know, he was astonished. He goes, you got a number? You have to have a number. And the lady, <laughs> and he goes, lady, I'm the only customer in the store. I don't need a number. Can't you see how ridiculous that is? She insisted that Robert take a number before agreeing to wait on him. And Robert, so he went to the, num the number dispenser, he pulled number 37, he gave it back to the salesperson. The salesperson then went to the number counter and revealed that the last customer was number 34. So she screamed, number 35, 35, and then went 36, 36, eventually 37. And Robert goes, I'm 37. And Robert, <laughs> and she goes, Without a cracking a smile, she said, may I help you? <laughs> Robert said, no thanks, turned around and walked out the door. See, we laugh at that story because it's absolutely ridiculous. But we can get like that as a church. 
You know, we can get so involved in finding our parking spot or disturbed because someone else took our seat, you know, our usual seat, or we break out, you know, of policy. Sometimes we get like that. But the Apostle Paul says, always abounding, because no one is ever obligated to return to this place unless there's a reason to do so. And so we, you and I, we play a part. We play a part, a vital part in this ministry. So don't just have the leaders say hello and chat. We all play that part. And just as the Corinthians were reading these verses as we are today, Paul says you're always to be abounding in the work of the Lord. Stay enthusiastic about it. The last one. So we've gone steadfast immovable, always abounding, is confident, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord, not in vain. Being confident of this, that we are energized to do and to be the very best we can be, knowing that the Lord notices, he records, and he rewards. Hebrews 6.10 says that God is not unjust to forget your labor of love. He's not unjust to forget how much you've worked for him and cared for others. No matter what you do, it's being remembered, it's being recorded, it will be rewarded. You can count on that. And because of that, because of that, you grow in strength. You grow in strength. I'll get the, I'll ask the, oh, he's already here, read my mind, Excellent. If we hope to sustain the dynamic ministry that the Lord has allowed us to begin, we need to be steadfast, immovable, abounding, and confident. Steadfast, immovable, abounding, and confident. Like I said, remember, no ministry is promised continuous significance or success. We'll not be what we are today, 10 years from now, if we miss the mark on those essentials. And I'm talking about the core of who we are. The core of who we are. We need to be steadfast and movable, always abounding. When we're always abounding, you know what? We don't let offense get us. We don't let things get us down. Actually, and I, I skipped the verse, but... It says in the word, in Psalms 119, 165, those who love the law have a great peace and nothing will offend them. Because when you're always abandoning, you grow up. That's what it is. And I just wanted to make that real quick connection. But I've been saving verse 14. I've been saving verse 14 to last. It says in verse 14 of chapter 16, Let all that you do be done in love. Do you notice that word all? A-L-L, all. All that you do, you need to do it in love. You need to love doing it. You need to love who you're doing it with. You need to love who you're doing it for. You need to love the one who made it possible for you to do things that you're doing. Love, love in the end, is the most important. And I want you to listen to a paraphrase of 1 Corinthians 13, and we're going to end on this. But it's from the message. I want you to listen to it from the context of what we've just talked about and see how it applies. See how it applies in what we do. If I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but don't love, I'm nothing but the creaky, but the creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and make everything plain as day, and if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've got to nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, 
I'm bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. Love doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Love never dies. Inspired speech will be over someday. Praying in tongues will end. Understanding will reach its limit. We know only a portion of the truth and what we say about God is always incomplete. But when the complete arise, our incompletes will be canceled. When I was an infant at my mother's breast, I gurgled and cooed like an infant. When I grew up, I left those infant ways for good. We don't yet see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist, but it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then, see it all as clearly as God sees us, knowing Him directly just as He knows us. But for now, until that completeness, we have three things to do to lead us towards that consummation. Trust steadily in God, hope unswervingly, love extravagantly and the best of the three is love convicting words convicting words let's all stand we're going to close our eyes and think and pray we'll close our eyes you've heard enough um, to know that we as a society are heading in the wrong direction but thankfully our church doesn't take its cues from the world system or society but to be strong we must be steadfast immovable abounding confident filled with love all the way through because it can make a real difference I wasn't going to do it but I'm going to do it just in case but there may be some of you even in this room who have never given their lives to Jesus, who've never asked Jesus to enter their lives. So I'm gonna plant that seed right now. You say, hey Mon, who is this God who can ensure that I will stand my life's course and stay the course over the time of my lifetime? Who is this God who would give me all the resources to do that? Who is this God who would help me to be always abounding even though I struggle? I want you to think about trusting Jesus today and asking him into your heart. And after the service, you can just come and see me. And because I feel uh, just the time, if you want to accept Jesus, as Saviour and Lord, I'm happy to talk you through that. But think about it. There are many of you here who may already know the Lord, but your life has forgotten about, you know, eternal things lately. And I challenge you today to admit where you haven't been where you haven't been what you should have been in many areas of your life. Maybe it's time to lay that before him and confess it and tell him you want him to take over. That's on call. And while you're thinking today, remember to pray for this church in these days that we continue to be a body of people who are attractive, authentic, you know, welcoming, forgiving, gracious, filled with love for what we're doing and for the people that we're doing it with. Dear Heavenly Father, we're all convicted as we hear these words. And we want to be this ministry that is sustained far beyond our years. 
We want it to be done well and to be done right with the right attitude. We humble ourselves before you, almighty God. We pray that we never receive a warning or if we have today, that we have left our first love, that we correct ourselves. Lord, prepare us, change us, begin today to use us as never before. We pray these things. And now to him who is able to guard us from stumbling and present us false, faultless before his glory with exceedingly great joy. To the only wise God be glory, power, honor, blessing, and dominion. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's remain standing as we sing the last song. We close this morning.
is abounding, oh Lord God. Be strong in that letting go, Lord God, that we may stand the death of time. We praise you and thank you. As we, Lord, <laughs> celebrate in your very presence, be with us, oh Lord, all through the week, all through the season, as we glorify you and lift you high in the heavens, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. God bless you all, and we'll see you next week again. And on through the week, be safe, be healthy. Amen.